Hi everybody, <laughs> my name is Andrew Crocker and uh, I am going to be your virtual instructor for this online class you're taking. Many online classes are comfortable enough unfurling you to an ebook and having you learn from there. We get a little bit more proactive here in uh, political science with Andrew Crocker. For me, you may call me Andrew, you may call me Crocker. Uh, most students feel most comfortable calling me Mr. Crocker. If that works for you, so be it. But uh, what I'll be doing with you over the course of this semester is giving you these lectures, which are required. You don't need these lectures for the chapter quizzes, but you will need them for the exams. The chapter quizzes largely go from the ebook, but the exams will come almost entirely from these lectures with some ebook sprinkled in. Um, now, you don't need to worry about that too much. Anytime an exam comes up, I'll give you all the preparation materials you need to succeed, I hope. Uh, and of course, the nice thing about these lectures is that anytime you need me to slow down, you can set it that way. Anytime you need me to speed me up, you can. You can pause me. The only thing you really can't do is ask me questions, but you can do that by emailing me. So anytime you have the urge to do so, please do so, and I'll try to get back to you in a day or so. Uh, so once again, these are required, but guys, I really, really want to uh, really want to advise you to take notes. You don't have to take notes for these lectures, but I just think they're incredibly important to do so. Um, and uh, I want you to be as prepared as possible. Uh, watch them when I assign them. Uh, try not to save them for like exam week because then your cramming and the information doesn't stick around as easily. Uh, so with that in mind, please budget time for these. Now this particular lecture is going to be about two different subjects. It's going to be about the foundation of democracy really here in America, what it looks like, what democracy even is and what it isn't. And then in addition to that, we'll also take a little time to talk about ideology. Now, for, we'll, we'll get to ideology when we get there, but um, that is normally a separate lecture for my in-person classes. So for these online classes, this lecture is going to be the longest you'll have all semester. So please don't freak out by the length of this particular lecture. I'll do the best I can to keep things humming along. But these lectures will be instrumental for you to succeed uh, in this class, so please do take them seriously. Please do take them very seriously. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and start us off. Uh, I am speaking to you here from The Void at OTC. I like to call it The Void. It's actually the Instructional Media Studio, or the IMS, but I will be calling it The Void, and I'll be speaking to you this way the entire semester. So hopefully you find this usable. I will say that I'm recording this in the summer of 2024. So awesome if you're a student over the next couple semesters, but that does mean that students of mine in 2025 or even 2026 might find some of this information outdated. If that's the case, I will update you immediately uh, above or below the video saying, hey, this information's outdated. This is actually what's happened since then. That's not gonna happen in this particular chapter, but it might happen in the future, so stay tuned. Guys, allow me to start off our lecture on this subject, the very first lecture we've had all semester, by hitting you with the ultimate truth of all government. The ultimate truth of all government. The sentence, for those of you taking notes, which I hope is all of you, the sentence, that, the first sentence you're about to write down in your notes is going to be the ultimate truth of all government. It's true no matter when in human history you've existed, what government you live under, um, where in the world you live. This is the, this, what I'm about to show you is true for all government. Guys, all government, it doesn't matter. There are no exceptions. All government reduces individual freedom and liberty. All government reduces individual freedom and liberty. Okay? There are no exceptions. For instance, we live in America. And America is free. But is America absolutely free? What do you think? I'll give you a second. Yes or no? What do you think? 50-50 chance. Go. <laughs> the answer is, of course it's not. It is not free. Heck no. If it was, abs I'm sorry, absolutely free. It's not absolutely free. If America was absolutely free, you could do whatever you want. If I want to beat up a student in my spare time, I can do that. If I want to steal that hat you're wearing, I can do that. So long as I get away in the opposite direction fast enough, I now look stylish and who can argue with the price? In addition to that, if I am really stressed out at work 
I don't want to take my stress home with me. I don't want to take my stress home with me. I, I tell you what, it'll really help me calm me down. I'll have an alcoholic beverage while I drive home from work. Uh -huh. In an absolutely free society, there are no consequences for that other than, you know, life consequences. Um, the government is not getting in the way of any of that. But of course, we don't live in that society. We live under a government. And all governments, all governments institute a variety of rules and regulations that we have to follow. And what they end up doing is they end up bossing us around in some area of our life. Um, and they are necessarily a loss of freedom. So, you know, I don't know if you've spent any time thinking about the millions of things you are not allowed to do because the government has rendered them illegal or, you know, they've been regulated out. I don't know how much time you spend thinking about that, but it can be a drag. There's millions of things I am not allowed to do because the government doesn't allow me to do them. But, I mean, it's not for nothing. Like, we do get stuff in return. I can't steal that hat off your head uh, without risking punishment, but I do know that uh, people, it's those laws prohibiting stealing makes it far less likely that I will have stuff stolen from me. I can't beat up a student after class, but I mean, you know, look at me. It's, it's far more likely that a student could beat the tar out of me. And thanks to these laws preventing assault, that is very unlikely to happen as well. I can't drink while I drive, but thanks to the laws banning that, when I get in my car and drive home after recording this lecture, I'm pretty comfortable knowing that um, nobody else is going to be out there drinking and driving as well. I mean, probably a few, but far less than if it was perfectly legal. So um, we do get these things in return from the government taking a degree of our freedom from us, which then begs the question, how much freedom do we actually want? Now, that's a tough question to answer because there is no answer. There is no objective answer to how much freedom is the correct amount of freedom. Because what we're doing with freedom is we're balancing it against other values that we'll talk about in two seconds. Because I, I really don't like how we talk about freedom in America, or politicians especially. You'll hear politicians say a bunch of things like, I'm for freedom. My opponent wants to take your freedom away from you. Yeah, it's not how I like to think of the, uh, think of the subject. Because freedom isn't binary. It's not like a light switch. Either you have it or you don't. It's a dimmer switch that you set one way or the other. And so that's why I like using this scales metaphor. And really what we're weighing is we're weighing freedom against order at all times. We want a safe society, but in order to have a safe society, we need to take away a degree of freedom, right? We want things to be protected. Therefore, we'll ban your freedom to steal. We want to be safe on the road. So we'll ban certain substances from being in your bloodstream when you when you drive, right? So uh, we th those are sensible. I think probably most of us are okay with that. But the, you know, what if there is a study that comes out that says that if we allow the government to monitor everything you do online, we'll be able to stop a few mass shooters more per year. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with giving up that degree of freedom in order to ensure this degree of order? And that's a really impossible choice. Now, I have my own opinions on that. I'm sure that you do too. But that's why freedom versus order doesn't have an answer. It just kind of figures out how do you want to balance it. And for the record, order isn't the only other thing that we're weighing against freedom. We also weigh equality against freedom. To what degree do we want equality to be ensured? Because life isn't fair, right? And so if we just allow things to be totally free all the time, life is going to be very unequal. So to what degree should the government take some freedom from us uh, in order to ensure more equality in our society. Let's say I run a bakery for some reason. It would be a terrible idea, so I can't, I can't bake a lick. But if I was uh, running a bakery and uh, I wanted to, for some reason I was prejudiced against who? Who do I want to be prejudiced against today? We'll say Indian Americans for some reason. If I'm prejudiced against Indian Americans for some reason, why can't I put a sign out there that says, now hiring. Indian Americans need not apply. Like, why can't I do that? In an absolutely free society, I could. But we've decided, we've put laws in place for decades now saying that you're actually not allowed to do that. Uh, if you're going to hire somebody, uh, you have to consider all applicants regardless of their race, right? If you're, going to, uh, if you're going to sell things, you have to sell to all customers regardless of their race. So um, 
that is pretty obvious. I think probably most of us support that. But to what degree should we be taxed in order to provide for people who are struggling on the lower ends of the economic spectrum? So you're taking some of my financial freedom away from me to make sure that some people are being taken care of, right? So what, to what degree are we okay with that? We'll talk about affirmative action later on. Affirmative action is a very big freedom versus equality conversation. So we'll get there, but for now, I just want you to understand that freedom really is uh, uh, on a scale. Yeah, I don't want you to think of it as like you either have freedom or you don't. Now, for the record, where do we want to put these lines? We want to put them here, 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 here. Where do we want to put lines here? How do we want to balance out our freedom? Uh, well, that allows me to blow your mind for the very first time in the semester. It turns out well, I'll blow your mind here in a second. Sometimes I forget the order of my scouts. So figuring out where to put those lines, here, 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 wherever. Wherever we put those lines, that's really what American politics is all about. Really all politics is all about, regardless of country, regardless of governmental system, regardless of when in human history you've existed. All governments have to balance that out, figure out where they, how they want to stack up their freedom against these other values. And, uh, you know, Politics can be complicated. It can be very complicated. Allow me to do my first sales pitch for Political Science 103. You're currently in 101. Take my 103 class in the spring. I would love to have you. I teach that every spring. It's on public policy. Fantastic class. But regardless of that, this stuff can get very, very complicated. And yet, despite the fact that politics can get very complicated, it really just comes down to two questions. We're always asking two questions. First of all, what resources does the government need? And that usually comes in the form of how much taxes does it need? How much manpower does it need? How much resources does it need? And second of all, what do we want the government to do with those resources? Okay. The, so this stuff can get really complicated. We'll have a whole chapter on like domestic policy and we'll talk about healthcare policy. Oh my gosh, that stuff can get really, really complicated. Really, really complicated. But aside from all that, even though that stuff gets really complicated, it really we're just trying to answer two questions. What resources does our government need and what should it do with those resources? That's really what it all comes down to, folks. It's really what it all comes down to. And um, shocker, this will be the first time I blow your mind all semester. I know we're only like 10 minutes in. But I waste no time with the mind blowing. I waste no time. Strap in, my friends. So when it comes to these questions, believe it or not, folks, we disagree on the answers. How about that? How about that? Does that blow your mind? Well, of course it doesn't blow your mind because you are alive and you have eyeballs and ears and you see and hear people arguing with each other all the time on politics. As most of you prior to taking this class probably know nothing about the subject. That's perfect. You're my perfect student. I will build you up. You're a mold of clay. I shall form you into a politically literate person by the end of this semester. But really, the only thing you know about politics is that whenever people talk about it, they lose their freaking minds and start arguing with each other. Uh, I sympathize with that. And that's because we disagree on how to balance freedom out with these other values. Now, we disagree for s several reasons. One re reason we disagree is because we have different preferences. Uh, you might be pro-life and you believe that the government should use its resources to prevent abortions from occurring. Whereas I might be pro-choice. And I believe in this hypothetical, the government should use its resources to ensure that abortions can occur when women seek them out. Now you and I can argue like cats and dogs on that conversation. And that's because we have different preferences, right? We have different preferences on the subject. But it's also possible that you and I have the same preference the same preference. However, we have different intensities of that preference. So now we're both pro-life in this hypothetical. And we both believe that the government should use its resources to prevent abortions. However, you might say, I, I am so pro-life, I think the government should really shut down everything it does until it can figure out how to ban all abortions nationwide. Whereas I might say, Ooh, hold your horses there. Listen, I don't want I spit on the glass there. <laughs> I don't think you can see that. But uh, I don't want abortions any more than you do. But uh, like we can multitask. We don't have to shut down the government. And that now you and I are arguing like cats and dogs, even though we agree on the subject. We just have different intensities. It's also possible that we agree or disagree because we have different 
uh, degrees of personal gain from any particular thing the government might do. Like it's very possible, you see this a lot when there's proposals for tax cuts and tax hikes. People will argue with each other over whether a tax cut makes sense. And oftentimes they're arguing selfishly whether the tax cut benefits them, right? And uh, same thing with tax hikes. Uh, we'll be arguing based on who suffers the most uh, from those tax, uh, tax cuts and tax hikes. So guys, that then begs the question, uh, because uh, over the next two or three years when I have this video as my most current lecture on chapter one, I'm probably going to have about a thousand students watch this video. Probably about a thousand students over a three year period will watch this video and that's a thousand different views of what the government should do. I mean, nobody fully, disagree fully agrees uh, with what the government should do with somebody else. We all have our own preferences no matter how minute they are. So with that in mind, we're in a country of 270 million adults. And if there's 270 million adults and 270 million different ways for people to think the government should be like this or be like that, then how do we settle the disagreement in our society? Well, this is the first time in this lecture where it matters where you live, what government you live under, it matters when in human history you've existed. Because if you live in a dictatorship, if we disagree in society, it doesn't freaking matter. The dictator determines it in, and the rest of us can just go fish if we don't like it. Um, but in, we don't live in a dictatorship. We do live in a democracy here in America. And so that is how we settle our disagreement. We settle it democratically with democracy. Now, about democracy, it can come in a couple of different flavors. Um, the most basic flavor of democracy that there is, is basically just a show of hands, which I've illustrated here. A show of hands, what we call direct democracy. Now I do put participatory democracy in here because sometimes your eBooks will call it participatory democracy. Do not call it that. Nobody calls it participatory democracy. Matter of fact, let me mark it out right now. Nobody calls it that. Heck no, everybody calls it direct democracy. Anyway, so that's when d uh, decisions are made by us directly. Hey, do you think we should have a higher minimum wage? Yes, no, and whoever gets the most hands up in the air, they get their way. Um, now there is, well, I'll, I'm kind of answering a question I'm gonna ask you here in a second anyways, but there really is no direct democracy on the national government scale. You'll notice you and I never vote on national issues. We never vote on national, we vote on national politicians, I'll talk about that in a minute. But we never vote on national issues. And that's because there really is no direct democracy for the federal national government. But there's a little direct democracy for state here in Missouri and local government. And that largely comes in the form of initiatives. And initiatives are a type of direct democracy. Voters can propose something to get onto a ballot via petition. They get a petition going. We'll talk about this more in a different lecture. But they get a petition going, and if it's successful, it ends up on the ballot so that you and I can vote. And then we say, yes, we want this, or no, we don't, and whoever gets the most hands in the air wins. That's why we have a higher minimum wage in Missouri. It's from an initiative. That's why Missouri is a relatively pro-union state initiative. That's why Missouri has recreational marijuana now. Uh, it certainly wasn't passed by law. It was what we, the people, wanted, and so we voted for it. So there's a little bit of that. Uh, on the state scale. That's an initiative. Now a different form of initiatives is when you have these people called lawmakers who work in Congress or Missouri's form of Congress, which is the General Assembly. And these people, instead of passing a law by voting on it themselves, and we'll talk about all that in the future chapter, they will just punt a bill to the ballot for you and I to vote on directly. That's called a referendum. Uh, that's called a referendum. Instead of you and I voting Instead of you I, uh, getting a petition going, this is just lawmakers saying, you know what, instead of making this law ourselves, let's punt it to the people and they can vote on it directly. You also, here in Missouri and most other states, have the ability to do some recalls. We can recall a governor, we can recall a member of the General Assembly, and uh, we can essentially fire them before their term is over. That's called a recall. But I want you to remember three things. Uh, I want you to note the common denominator of all three of these things. Okay? Publicly voted on, publicly voted on, publicly voted on. All three of these things 
are public votes. And that's what makes direct democracy direct democracy. It's the people making the ultimate decision. Now, for the most part, America is actually an indirect democracy. Now, this is sometimes called representative democracy. Um, but uh, we are, for the most part, an indirect democracy where decisions are made by elected officials on our behalf. So we are not making direct decisions. We are not saying yay or nay. Instead, we're voting for the people who will do that. And that's uh, what the United States does on the federal level. For the most part, the federal government is, is entirely indirect democracy at best. You and I will never vote on directly anything for the United States. We will sometimes do it for Springfield, Missouri, and we will sometimes do it for Missouri, because all of you, in case you didn't know, you're now a Missouri citizen. If you're not in Missouri right now, if you're taking my class, you're a Missouri citizen. Yeah. So it's good to know different flavors of what democracy comes in, which then begs the question then, it begs the question, what is it that makes a democracy a democracy? Now, this is a reason why you take this class. This is one of the central questions that makes this class necessary. Because if you ask somebody who hasn't taken this class, what do you think the average person is going to say for what makes a democracy a democracy? What they're probably going to say is voting. Well, if you vote, it's a democracy. But no! No, my friends! Voting doesn't make you a democracy. In most dictatorships, there are elections. And shocker of shocker, the dictator usually wins with like 99% of the vote. How does the dictator do it? Well, because it's not a democracy. This person is threatening people. This person is murdering his opponents. This person is blocking his opponents. Um, so yeah, they vote in Russia, but Russia is not a democracy. Now are they? So what is it that makes a democracy a democracy? Let's cover that right now. So the first thing that makes a democracy a democracy is universal suffrage, meaning everybody gets to participate. And of course, when we say everybody gets to participate, we don't mean everybody, everybody, right? Like my children, I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, like they don't get to participate. They don't get to participate, no, heck no. However, uh, when we say universal suffrage, we do mean like, you know, as many people as is reasonable. Now, what is reasonable to you? We'll talk about that in two seconds because that obviously can be a subject of some debate. Another thing that makes a democracy a democracy is that majority rules. There really is no point to having an election. If the yeas get 60%, the nays get 40%, and the 40% wins. Why are we having an election if we're doing that? Well, so majority rules does is a key democratic component. Also a key democratic component is political equality, meaning everybody's votes count the same. So we are a democracy because we largely march to these, but we also have some things that uh, maybe uh, defy democracy a little bit. I'm not saying that there's parts of American democracy that are undemocratic, but they kind of can be depending on which uh, on your views, right? Like for instance, we have some we have uh, questions about how easy it should be to vote, and it's something that we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, how easy should it be to vote? Who should have access to vote? Um, the electoral college is how we choose our presidents, and it, as you may have noted from the a couple elections in the 21st century, it's possible for you to get fewer votes and yet still become president. How is that possible? Well, tune in to chapter eight. We'll have a an elongated conversation about how that happens. In addition to that, what happens in most parts of the country when you've been convicted of a crime, you've served your sentence, and you are now free to uh, uh, you're now free to, to go. You you now have been released back into society. Well, you're a felon, and in most parts of the country, you do not get your right to vote back. Is that anti-democratic? You know, maybe depending on your perspective. Also, it's worth noting that if you're an immigrant, you do not get the right to vote in America. So is that anti-democratic? Because immigrants have just as much at stake here in America as we the people, uh, the, we the citizens of America do. So maybe they should have a right to vote as well. So you get the idea that we could have debates about these things, even though we broadly agree on this. We might have any number of particulars where we do disagree. And that transitions us to what I think is the most important conversation from chapter one. And that's how does American democracy work? Because as we just noticed, American democracy maybe isn't the purest form of democracy. It does have some elements maybe that works against the majority. Um, 
and neuters majority power. We'll talk about these uh, as they emerge over the course of American uh, over the course of this class. Um, but how does our democracy work? And the simple answer to that is there's multiple theories that disagree with each other. So let me run them through you, and then you can kind of weigh it out for yourself, what makes the most sense to you. Now, the version of American democracy we have been raised on since we were children in grade school is the majoritarian model. Now, the majoritarian model is, uh, you might not have always learned it as a majoritarian model. You might just think of it as American democracy because it says the majority, the majority of the people say they want something and then the government goes and does it. Like that is our version of American democracy. It is what people mean by like government by the people. You'll see protesters sometimes holding signs that say government by the people for the people. Well, what does that even freaking mean? Whether they know it or not, they're endorsing the majoritarian model, which makes sense. The majoritarian model makes sense. And there's a reason why we are taught it in grade school because it is very user friendly, very straightforward. It's simple. It's uh, beautiful in a way. It's a responsive government, right? We say we want this and the government provides it. Well, we don't want this anymore, so the government stops providing it. That's what the majoritarian model suggests. But guys, it's not a great model of American democracy. It's not a great way of understanding how American democracy actually works. It's not. And that's because it makes bad assumptions about who we are as a people. It makes bad assumptions. It makes assumptions about who we are as a people that are, I would argue, flat wrong. Now, the first argument it makes is that we are proactive participants in our democracy, that we the people are chomping at the bit to vote and make our voice heard. Oh, you listen to me, government. As soon as you give me an election, we are going to show up in droves to vote. But are we proactive participants in our democracy? I mean, we are once every four years whenever there's a presidential election, which this is currently 2024. We have one coming up. In 2024, in November, we'll have a presidential election that is likely going to get somewhere between 65 to 75 percent of America voting. That's, that's pretty darn good. That's really the only time we give a crap enough to show up to vote. Um, there are midterm elections uh, in the middle of a president's term where um, we'll be lucky if there's 50 percent turnout. Did you know every year here in Springfield, Missouri, there are local elections in April? Every year, folks. Every year. Did you know that? Did you know that? What do you think the turnout is for those April elections? Did you guess 15% give or take? So when we vote for in those April elections for city council, for school boards, sometimes on uh, changes to the Springfield City Charter, those elections, those elections, 85% of our community is sitting them out. 85%. So are we proactive participants in our community? in our democracy? Yeah. I think that is a dicey proposition at best. Now, in addition to that, it also assumes that we're well informed about the issues in our country. And I would argue that we're not. Most polling seems to confirm that Americans are pretty ignorant about American policy. And that's not because necessarily, that's not because necessarily we're idiots, but it's because we're busy. Like we have stuff going on in our lives. Like I might say, most, most Americans are really like lay people on everything under the sun except for like five or six things you the person watching this video right now you are an expert on five or six things under the sun i bet you if i pointed at you and i wanted to know something about those subjects you would be able to teach this class a version of whatever it is those five or six things are because you know them so well okay and I, that could be that could be nuclear propulsion or that can be like the office trivia but you're an expert on several things, uh, and I, I like to think I know American democracy pretty well. I'd like to think I do. That's kind of why I have this job. But uh, I don't know how my car works. I don't know how car how does my car work when I turn it. I put gas in, and then the gas gas is gone after a while. Where did it go? Like I, I don't know the. I'm I'm really asking because I don't know the answer to these questions. So um, most of us are just kind of lay people when it comes to politics. We don't have a great understanding of it. And so a majoritarian model assumes we're experts on like Ukraine, the war in Ukraine right now. But most Americans don't really know much about it. In addition to that, the majoritarian model also assumes that we have free and easy access to vote. And 
Do we? Well, the answer to that is sometimes. Sometimes we have free, free and easy access to vote, but not all the time. Now, if you live in the Ozarks, voting is relatively easy in the Ozarks because we don't have a ton of people living here. And uh, when, you go, when it's time to vote, you can show up and vote you know, pretty easily. Um, when, I, the last, when I voted this past April, I walked in and walked out in about four or five minutes. But that's because I live in a largely rural area. If you live in an urban area, it can be difficult to vote. It can be difficult to vote because you have the same number of polling locations, but you have millions of people now living on top of each other. So it can be difficult to vote. Sometimes we'll hear horror stories every presidential election of people waiting three, four, five hours just to cast their one vote. And when do we have elections anyways? Do you know what day of the week we always have elections on? It's Tuesdays. Tuesdays. We always have them on Tuesdays. Why Tuesdays? Why not hold them on a Saturday when everybody's off work? You know, why not do that? Well, that, that doesn't help anyways because not everybody is off work on Saturdays. A lot of you guys are teenagers and 20-year-olds. So a lot of you guys um, are working on Saturday. So that doesn't help you. So, 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 so tell you what, let's have an election holiday, okay, where we, none of us have to work, none of us have to go to school. We can have the day off. We can wake up whenever we want, eat a sandwich, go vote, and then just move on with our lives. Why not do it that way? We don't do it that way. So it's not, no, it's not as easy. It's not as easy to vote sometimes as this theory suggests it is. So really the majoritarian model is known as a classic model. It's kind of an outdated model. It's not a great way of understanding how American democracy actually works. Which again is interesting. I'm not sitting here saying that grade school lied to you and they talked about the nature of American democracy, um, but they taught you a kind of an outdated version of, of, of our understanding of American democracy. A much better version of how American democracy actually works, a much better model, is called the pluralist model. And I don't know if the pluralist model gets us home, but it gets us a lot of the way there. So the pluralist model We'll define it here in a second, but that, let's actually work in reverse on the pluralist model. Let's start with assumptions. Let's start with assumptions, okay? Let's start with assumptions. So the first assumption the pluralist model makes is it rejects, really the first two, is that it just kind of rejects everything we just assumed from the majoritarian model. It rejects the idea that we are proactive participants in our democracy. It rejects the notion that uh, we have free and easy access to polling, uh, to voting at all times. It rejects the idea that we're an informed population. No, not really, not necessarily, no. So from there, the pluralist model makes an alternative assumption that really isn't political in nature. It's actually a psychology assumption that it makes. Uh, and it assumes that people tend to group up. People in society tend to group up among themselves uh, with, with folks similar to themselves, and then they begin organizing politically. Now this isn't political science at all, it's psychology. And social psychology tells us that we're just naturally, we naturally gravitate. We naturally gravitate towards people who are like ourselves. We naturally gravitate towards people who are like ourselves. As a result, as a result, over time these groups form of like-minded people and they begin to organize uh, politically. And that's what the pluralist model argues. It argues that what politics in America actually is, is a conflict among these groups. We'll call them interest groups. They get their very own chapter later on in this, in, in this semester. These groups fight with each other over who should have more influence over what the government is doing at all times. Because, again, the pluralist model assumes that we the people are not particularly engaged, but you know who is engaged? These interest groups. And so the government is doing this, to use this metaphor of the pluralist democracy uh, model. The government's doing this, it has its hand to its ear. It's like, come on America, tell me what you want me to do. But we the people aren't answering that question. We don't really vote that much. We're not really well informed. So in this metaphor, while the government's doing this, we the people are like on the opposite side of the room whispering nonsense answers. But you know who is very loud and in the ear of the government? It's these interest groups, which are like, do this. 
with a bullhorn. The government's like, oh, the people have spoken. And so while the majoritarian model believes in government by the people, the pluralist model argues it's actually more like government by competing interest groups. These interest groups are squabbling with each other and trying to influence the government to adopt this policy or adopt that policy more than we the people are. Now again, I, I've stressed this to you before. Uh, this is a more contemporary model. I don't know if pluralist model is the perfect way of describing American democracy, but it, it gets us a lot closer to home than the outdated majoritarian model does. Now, a different model of American democracy is to argue that American democracy is a sham, okay? And this is called elite theory. It says that uh, regardless of uh, uh, how we the people think we operate either as a mass of people, which the majoritarian model argues, or as groups, interest groups of people, which is what the pluralist model argues, really society, it's like the Wizard of Oz. It's just being ruled by a bunch of rich people who control everything. They just want to exercise the levers of government to, to, to further their own self-interest. We call this elite theory. Now, I don't know if you've heard of elite theory, but maybe you've heard of the fancy word to describe elite theory, and that's known as oligarchy. Have you ever heard that word before? Um, now, I'm not going to ask you to know oligarchy. I'm not going to ask you to know it, so you don't need to know it, but you might hear oligarchy a few times over the course of your life, and now you know what it's talking about. It's talking about elite theory, basically. You'll hear somebody say, well, you know, America's not actually a democracy at all. It's actually an oligarchy. Well, whether you agree with them or not, now you know what it means. And I don't know, do you believe that? Do you believe that American democracy is actually a sham and actually elites run all of it instead? You know, your mileage may vary. Uh, I am kind of skeptical of myself, but your mileage may vary. And if that's how you, uh, you believe, so be it. But that's, this class is all about making sure we at least understand it. So it's important to, while we talk about democracy, we don't just talk about what democracy is. We must also talk about what democracy is not, my friends. Democracy is not. Matter of fact, most of the people that live on planet Earth most of the people that live on planet Earth do not live in a democracy. They just don't live in a democracy. They live in a non-democracy of some kind. So let's talk about some different types of non-democracies, how they differ, and what kind of distinguishes them, generally speaking, from democracy. Let's go ahead and do that. Starting with totalitarianism. You know, you read about this in your ebook, I hope, but totalitarianism uh, it's uh, fun to say. It's, a, it's an amazing word, totalitarian. It's an amazing word to say. But uh, generally speaking, it is total government control. The government controls all aspects of your life. Clearly, you don't have any political voice. But in addition to that, the government also dictates what your social life looks like, what your cultural lo life looks like, what your religion is. Okay, so this is total government dictatorship over your entire life. Now, the classic real-world example, what country do you immediately think of? North Korea, baby. North Korea. They uh, have a uh, dictator who regards himself as a god emperor um, who, you know, everything you do socially in life, I can circle that there, everything you do socially in life your culture, your religion, it all needs to be about how this guy is unquestionable and uh, just, a, just an absolute dictatorship of all aspects of your life, okay? Uh, but we have fictional versions of this too, fictional versions of this too. The classic example, the classic novelization of the government controlling all aspects of your life is 1984. Have you read 1984? You freaking should. Maybe I should assign it. <laughs> but it's an easy read. It's a depressing read, but it's an easy read about a society that controls all aspects of your life to the point where, you know, you'll hear 1984 reference in American politics sometimes. I don't think people have read 1984. Anytime they say President Biden or former President Trump, this is like 1984. They have not read 1984. Okay, the 1984, they have literally have thought police who ensnare you and torture you in the ministry of love. Uh, maybe that's a spoiler alert, I don't think so. Uh, but we have other more modern examples of totalitarian regimes. Do you remember the Hunger Games? 
Uh, a few of students, I have not read this, but students have recommended that I read The Giver over and over again. So I'm going to give The Giver a read. Hopefully by the time um, you see me in person, I will have read The Giver. Uh, but uh, there, there is a uh, different kind of uh, Hulu show called uh, uh, Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid's Tale is absolutely a totalitarian regime. All right, we're talking about non-democracies. Uh, now, in addition to totalitarianism, authoritarianism is, in fact, once again, a government that gives you no voice. The, the government is completely controlled by some sort of ruler. Maybe this person calls themselves a, a, a dictator. Maybe they call themselves a monarch. It, it doesn't really, maybe they call themselves an autocrat. Sometimes you'll hear that. You don't need to know that word. But uh, a Joe Biden called the, uh, the uh, what do you call the dictator of China, called him an autocrat early in his presidency. So I just want you to at least put your eyeballs on that word once. This is what that means. Now, despite the fact that the government control is controlled by a dictator and you don't really have a voice in that, you do have like private business. You do have like culture. You can have your own culture. You can have your own religion in these countries. They're not controlling all aspects of your life. They're just controlling the government to the degree to which you don't really have a voice. A classic example of that is Russia. Russia is very much an authoritarian regime. Now, they have elections, but every time somebody challenges uh, 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 Putin, they get charged with some fake crime, thrown in a prison cell uh, in Siberia, and die. So um, this is very much a dictatorship. But like Russia is also known for having a somewhat modern counterculture. There's a, there's a large Jewish population, a large Christian population, a large Muslim population in different parts of Russia. So you can have your own culture. Uh, you can you just you know you just can't challenge the the dictator. Now, for, oddly enough, when we talk about pop culture, pop culture has a weird love affair with uh, authoritarians. There's very little pop cultural <laughs> touchstones when we're growing up of like democratically elected leaders. Uh, I don't know if you ever read Lord of the Rings or saw the movies, but if you re ever read Lord of the Rings or watched the movies, there ain't nobody getting elected. Uh, most of the people in Lord of the Rings who are leadership figures are not elected to their positions. Theoden is king because his dad was king. And it, before his uh, son dies in, in the, the course of the, the course of the books, um, his son was going to be king after him. That's not that's a dictatorship, my friend. That's an authoritarian regime. Have you seen any Disney movies ever? If you've ever seen any Disney movies ever, you'll notice that literally everybody in Disney movies is like a king or a queen. There ain't nobody getting elected in a Disney movie. So <laughs> you see, but most of these guys are like sympathetic characters, right? Same thing with Lord of the Rings. Most of the kings in that show are seen as sympathetic characters. So we kind of have a weird love affair with like kings and queens and princes and princesses in pop culture. You know, not always though. And sometimes, sometimes these guys are jerks <laughs> in pop culture. If you ever watch Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones is populated with kings and queens, half of whom are royal jerks. This guy sucks. You suck. Okay, it's, 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 it's cathartic for me to finally be saying that to this guy given uh, how much turmoil, emotional turmoil, this character put me through <laughs> when I was watching those shows. All right, so uh, let's make sure that we do a real basic line in the sand here because we are talking about democracy. Right now we're talking about non-democracy. But can we draw a line in the sand? What's the line in the sand that once we step over it, we are no longer in a democracy? And if we step back, well, now we're in a democracy. Well, it's hard to do that. But the best I can do, the best I can do is this. This is the line in the sand. Guys, anytime the laws that govern us are not being determined by popular will, then it's not a democracy. Democracy is popular will. Okay, That's when we the people are voting for somebody who put policies into place or we directly vote on the policies ourselves. That's democracy. Anything absent that, it's not a democracy. Okay, so that's the line in the sand. Now, there's a couple other forms of non-democracy that I'll discuss real briefly. One form of non-democracy is known as a theocracy. That's when a govern uh, a religion uh, governs um, your country. It can look like the Vatican, right? The Vatican uh, is a basically a city country that is Catholic. It is a the Catholic theocracy. The Pope is all three branches of government. Now, it can be democratic. We've seen this in the Middle East, where like Muslim countries will have 
uh, Muslim majority countries will vote to effectively make their country a theocracy. So that can be democratic. But uh, while determining whether we're a theocracy or not can be a democratic decision, if we're just letting the Bible or the Quran or the whatever any other holy books are call the shots for us, well, then that is uh, not popular will necessarily. Now, I talked about this before about oligarchies. A couple other names for oligarchies would be like um, an aristocracy, uh, a plutocracy, these two words are just largely synonyms. All three of these words are largely synonymous with each other, but we've already talked about that. Uh, and you know, there's actually another form of non-democracy that's actually pretty common here in the United States. That's right, there is a non-democracy that's common in the United States, and it's known as elderhoods. And that's when your community is run by elders, and you see this a ton in Native American society. Native American society, they will have elders where decisions are largely made by people who have aged into the role. They have aged into the role. There's no story of like some upstart 25 year old who somehow gets elevated into the elders, or maybe there is, if you're Native American, email me and correct me. But, um, uh, but, but these uh, elderhoods are non-democratic, right? Popular will is not what's driving the decisions, it's the elders who ascend to that position via age. However, I will say that elderhoods are also very popular and in some cases kind of regarded as sacred by um, Native American communities. So just because we're talking about non-democracies doesn't necessarily mean we're talking about it's a terrible idea, blah, blah, blah. I don't really have an opinion on elderhoods. I just want to be clear that the, the general nature of them is non-democratic. All right. So that leads us to what I regard as one of the more in uh, uh, more important questions that I'll ask this semester. Now that we've drawn a line between what is democracy and what isn't democracy, allow me to ask you, what is going on in Black, in Black Panther? This is one of my favorite movies, but the government structure, I can't quite figure out if it's a democracy, a non-democracy, is it an elderhood? Is it a oligarchy? I mean, to be king, you have to beat the crap out of somebody on a waterfall. But the only people that ever get to fight and challenge in that are of royal blood, and they have to be put up by the elders, right? The, this is an elder of the uh, border tribes, and then you have Mbaku here, and you have, uh, oh, what is his, uh, what is uh, Killmonger's name? Is he Ndajaka? I can't quite remember. But regardless, I don't really know. It has elements of autocracy. It has elements of... Um, of, uh, of uh, elderhood. It even has a little theocracy if you listen to kind of the opening, the, the, the opening part of it. And so the answer is I really don't know. I don't know if this is democracy or not, what kind of government it is. All I know is that you should get Disney Plus and watch The Black Panther and then watch Wakanda Forever because they are like my favorite movies. All right, let's keep moving. Now, late in chapter one, there is a conversation about ideology, different political belief systems, and we'll talk about that in just one second. But it really only talks about ideology for a page or two. Guys, unacceptable, unacceptable, that is unacceptable. We need to have a longer conversation about ideology, so allow me to take the next 15, 20 minutes or however long to talk about ideology. You need to know this stuff. And so largely a bunch of the conversation I'm about to have with you is not in the ebook here. I just want to make sure that so long as ideology runs our political conversation, we should have a pretty good idea of what exactly we're talking about. All right, so this is the light that tells me I'm still recording effectively, so I need to make sure so I don't have to, so I'm not just wasting my time in the summer in a black room achieving a paleness rarely seen. All right, so we're talking about ideology. Let's start with the basics. What is political ideology? Well, your ebook offers its own term. Your ebook suggests uh, its own definition. Your ebook says it's a comprehensive set of beliefs about the nature of politics and the role of government. That, there's nothing wrong with that definition. That is a fine definition. I don't have any beef with that definition. Except it's a little complicated. Can we simplify it? This PLS 101. Can we please simplify this, please? Let's go ahead and do that. The way I would say, your political ideology is your political philosophy. That's pretty much it, whether it's well-formed or not. That's what it is, is your political philosophy. Let me ask you a question right now. Please don't answer out loud, because I don't want to know how weird you are. 
but what would you like to see the government accomplish? I mean, what do you think the government should do? Now, whatever your answer is to that question, however well-formed or underformed it is, is, a, is your political ideology. It's your political ideology. Um, and that's really, all, that's really all we're talking about here, but the conversation can get pretty complicated from there. From there, I want to ask you, whatever your answer to my question is, mind if I ask you a follow-up question? How slavish are you to that belief system that you just stated to me? Okay? I think the government should stay out of people's lives and let them largely fend for themselves. I, I think the government should be proactive and help people on an individual basis, you know, or some version of stuff like that, right? So how slavish are you to that opinion that you just voiced to me, your computer or phone screen? Well, if you believe that your belief system is right at all times to every question, then you're what we might call an ideological person. An ideological person. Now, there's nothing wrong with being ideological any more than there's anything wrong with being short or tall. Nothing wrong with being ideological. Matter of fact, most of our movies are about you. People who had their beliefs and stuck to them no matter all the challenges in society trying to shoot them down. But, uh, and they succeed and they change society as a result. Like, all of our movies are about you. So, being ideological is a bit romantic. It's a bit, it can be powerful, right? Uh, now, in addition to that, maybe you are of the belief that your belief system is correct, but that you, you, you can see wiggle room, right? Like you can see different solutions from different perspectives that might be more effective at different times. That's called being more pragmatic. And you're not a lot of fun if you're pragmatic. Not a lot of movies are made about pragmatic people, but a lot of laws are made by pragmatic people. So these people are kind of like the shining lights that the rest of us look to and admire, and these people are often the people actually kind of making the compromises to get stuff done. So they both have their strengths, right? They both have, there's nothing wrong with being one or the other. But we see some political candidates, I think a, uh, we see some political candidates who are uh, more ideological, more uncompromising, and some people who are like, hey, listen, I can, I can cut a deal like nobody's business. And that's just different sales points, right? What appeals to you most? Now, when we talk about ideology, we're largely, we're in America, and in America, the conversation is largely between conservative and liberal. And we're going to talk about both these terms, but it's important before we talk about conservative versus liberal, that we have an understanding of the arena that these two beliefs are fighting in. And that arena is capitalism. What is capitalism? We have a pretty decent idea of what capitalism is. You live in a capitalist society, but let's make sure we have a, a, a more precise understanding of exactly what and why uh, capitalism is. So let's start off with a definition. Capitalism is an economic system. Okay, It's an economic system we have to understand before we get into liberal versus conservative. Capitalism is an economic system characterized, and this is really the most important part right here. Let me mark it. This is the most important part of this definition is between these yellow lines. Capitalism is when wealth creating assets are privately owned. Now it's got other things going forward, free markets, freedom of contract, but this is what capitalism is. Private ownership of wealth creating assets. Now if this is your first time to this economic term, wealth, <laughs> that's, word, that's sound. Whew, that sound is going to get old this semester, isn't it? Let's try not to do that too much. But anyways, wealth creating assets is just a fancy pants way of saying businesses. There are other things that are wealth creating assets, like stock options, but for the most part we're talking about businesses. Businesses create wealth. That's why they hire us and pay us. They are generating wealth by selling goods and services. And in a capitalist society, wealth creating assets are privately owned. Privately owned. Now when things are privately owned, who doesn't own them? The answer to that is the government, right? Because if the government, where do I stand? Do I, <laughs> can I stand over here? No, I'm going to stand over here. This is, this is all good. I'm learning for the remainder of my <laughs> semester with you. Anyways, um, when the government owns things, it's known as publicly owned. That's why there's public parks, right? A park that is owned by we the people through the government. That's a public park. But no, businesses are privately owned in a capitalist society. And uh, 
the reason they are privately owned, what they end up doing is they end up competing with each other. That is the whole point of capitalism, is that these private businesses that are owned not by the public, but by you and I, or sometimes richer versions of you and I, and they are competing with each other. So the example I like bringing up in class is like if you walk your dog through down a street, uh, down a particular street, and one day you see somebody with the tomato stand, and they're selling tomatoes, yelling at you as you walk by, buy these tomatoes, they're great, they're delicious, you can slice them, you can dice them, they go great with salad, whatever. And if you buy them, they're a dollar a bushel, or however much tomatoes cost, I actually have no idea. And so if you buy those tomatoes, you are going to pay for how much it costs them to grow the tomatoes, plus a little extra scratch, so they can profit off selling tomatoes and go home and feed their many, many children. And then one another day, there is a different tomato stand set up across the street. And so now you have two different tomato stands competing with each other as you walk by. That is the free market, my friend. They are competing with one another. Now, in that competition between these two tomato stands, the government has a role, and that's as a referee. The government referees these two businesses. It says, you know, keep in mind, that doesn't mean they're, the government's controlling them. For the most part, these two businesses, these two tomato stands, can sell ch however they want. They can um, charge whatever they want whenever they make their money. They can do whatever they want with their money. But there are some rules they can't cross, right? I can't have a bunch of underage children working my fields without paying them, and, or, or at all. <laughs> and if I have people of the correct age, I have to pay them. In addition to that, I can't shove, like, you know, cocaine into my tomatoes. Right, like that. Maybe that's good for business for repeat customers, but, that, but that's certainly not going to be very good for public health. Right, so the government can ban that stuff. Keep in mind, it's not controlling what I'm doing. It's just drawing a line saying you're not allowed to do these things. Okay, now um, that's fine. That's what capitalism is, but that doesn't answer the question why. Why are we doing this? What is the point? And the answer to that question is known as the invisible hand of the market. Now, this was a concept invented a long time ago by a guy named Adam Smith. I don't care if you know that. But the whole point of the invisible hand of the market is that the competition between these tomato stands, they're going to make products better over time as they try to run each other out of business. I'm going to have to make better and better tomatoes. That's really not the best example, is it? Because tomatoes can only get so good. But if you and I are selling technology, if you and I are selling phones, over and over again, each phone company is going to have to one-up their game and try to outdo the other to try to run them out of business and swallow up all that phone money for themselves. In addition to that, prices have to stay reasonable, right? Because the second I start charging too much for my phone, although I would argue they're all too expensive, but uh, if I start charging too much for my phone, your phone company can undercut me, right? And so the whole point of this, the whole point is that um, quality of life in our society will get better and better as products get better and better. And hopefully prices stay reasonable. And, and, and. But that's what capitalism is, and that's why we do it. Give you a moment on that. Um, the, a different economic system that sometimes gets the boogeyman treatment in America is not a capitalist. Matter of fact, let me set a scene for you, okay? You have two different, uh, two different tomato stands and they're wheeling and dealing tomatoes and uh, people are coming by and buying from one and then buying from the other. And then one day, a communist walks down the street. What is happening with communism? So anyways, let's put the definition up on the board before we move on. Communism, now, of course, there's a, uh, a great definition here, but the key thing is between these yellow lines. Communism now endorses public ownership of wealth-creating assets. Public ownership of wealth-creating assets. I'll give you a moment on that. So the point of communism is, um, well, let's, let's go back to my hypothetical. You have two people, they are wheeling and dealing um, 
uh, on a street trying to sell their tomatoes as best as possible. And a communist walks between them and he looks at one tomato stand and he looks at the other and he says, why the fighting? Why must we compete? The two of you are clearly tomato geniuses. Have you ever considered cooperating rather than competing with each other? Maybe if you two put your heads together, you guys could create a whole new race of super tomatoes from which society could more broadly benefit from. So that's really what communism is arguing. And again, I'm speaking in very, very basic terminology here, oversimplifying for sure. But of course, these two tomato stands don't want to work together. They want to run the other person out of business and swallow up that sweet tomato money all for themselves. But that's not how communism works. It's not like we're choosing to work together. It's the government mandating us to work together. So it's government mandated cooperation, right? Government mandated cooperation. So now instead of what you'd have in a capitalist society, which is like individual private tomato companies, now you have a government run tomato industry. And needless to say, the government is now controlling that industry. It's not regulating us anymore. It's straight up controlling it. You must sell tomatoes this way. You must charge this much. When you earn the money, here's mostly how you have to spend that money. So obviously, you might be able to detect right off the bat why communism is unpopular. And communism is unpopular in America to the extent to which it's like a boogeyman sometimes. You'll hear politicians accuse each other of being communists from time to time um, because it requires an extremely powerful government. Uh, obviously, if you empower the government that much, you are running a risk, right? You're running a risk of the government running roughshod over you. And that's why, not that capitalism deserves a halo or anything. Capitalism is, is not some innocent entity that's amazing in every conceivable way. But uh, communist countries compared to capitalist countries, uh, it's not even close. Human rights are generally far more respected in capitalist countries. And again, I'm speaking very generally here. Human rights, civil rights, civil liberties. If you give the government this much power, there is a historical track record of the government kind of running roughshod and um, uh, oppressing and abusing its citizens. So that's why it's important to remember when we talk about liberal versus conservative, which we will be doing um, here in just one second. When we talk about liberal versus conservative, the whole conversation, it's pretty complicated, but ultimately it comes down to how should capitalism work? Because keep in mind, here in America, the whole conversation over capitalism, ooh, can I maybe do that with my hand? <laughs> that was, that's not very good. For now. All right, so <laughs> the whole conversation in America over capitalism, uh, it, it, I'm sorry, the whole political conversation is over capitalism. And really, liberalism and conservatism are both under the capitalist umbrella. Uh, and so, really, that's the conversation. These guys are arguing over how capitalism uh, should operate in America. So let's talk about both of these terms, shall we? Let's talk about both of them. Now, my PowerPoint starts with liberalism first, so that's where we shall begin. Liberalism, my friends, advocates for positive government action to improve the welfare of individuals. That's, that's really the most important part, is that first part all the way up to that first comma. It advocates for positive government action to improve the welfare of individuals. Also supports civil rights, exhibits a degree of tolerance for political and social change. Um, how much do you know about liberalism? Do you consider yourself a liberal? Um, is the one thing you know about liberalism is that you genuinely hate it? Maybe you know a lot about it and you like it or dislike it. However you come down on liberalism, it's fine. But however you come down on it, a third of Americans consider themselves liberal. A third of Americans do. A third. Matter of fact, according to some polling, it's even higher than that. And the reason for that is because it's a reasonable ideology. It's reasonable. And the reason liberalism is ideal is uh, the reason liberalism is reasonable <clears throat> is because it is based on an indisputable truth that you can't argue with, even if you hate liberalism. And that indisputable truth is 
We're in a capitalist society, my friends. And capitalism is a competition. And in a competition, not everyone can win. Not everyone can win. You're going to have some people who do amazing. You're going to have a good number of people who do pretty well for themselves. You'll have a good number of people who are like struggling a bit, but they're getting by. But you will, in a capitalist society, without exception, have a portion of the society that just can't get ahead and is getting their butts economically kicked. And I don't mean like, oh man, rent's going to be tight this month. I mean like hunger, starvation, unemployment, homelessness, people just at the very bottom of the economic spectrum. And so if that's the case, and it indisputably is, even if you hate liberalism, this is true. If that's the case, what should we do about it? Well, liberalism suggests we should put a net under society called the social safety net. The social safety net, and you don't need to know these examples that go into it, but these are things that go into the social safety net. If you are down on your luck, we provide you a degree of, uh, of welfare. If you are poor enough in most parts of the country, we'll provide you some health care on the government. If you're elderly, you shouldn't have to work anymore in theory. We'll give you Social Security. We'll give you Medicare. If you're hungry, we'll give you uh, some degree of food security and so on. Some of you are probably taking this class on a Pell Grant. Guess what a Pell Grant is? Pell Grant is a part of the social safety net. So the uh, social safety net is this net that will catch people, we hope, uh, to, to make sure that their lives don't completely collapse. Um, you know, they're not going to be dining on caviar on their poverty yachts, but, you know, we hope that that'll give them enough resources to kind of climb out of the social safety net altogether. Now, the social safety net is not cheap. It's not cheap. It costs. And uh, for the most part, the people in the net only pay for some of it. Most of the net is paid by taxpayers, um, by other, by the rest of the taxpaying population, which means this is a degree, of, it's going to necessarily have a degree of redistribution of wealth. Um, and this can be controversial, but most of us are okay with redistribution of wealth, for instance, and this is not a hypothetical, this is me speaking from my perspective, this is Andrew Crocker talking, this is my opinion. Tax me, guys. If it means children can eat, please tax me. No child goes hungry. Tax Andrew Crocker if it means children can eat. And I pr probably most of us feel that way. And the question is, how far do we want to go with that? Um, now, in addition to that, it all, liberalism has a government doing more things for more people. It's going to try to work harder to more stridently regulate businesses. Literally yesterday, today is May 24th. May 24th, literally yesterday, the Biden administration said it's going to sue Ticketmaster to force Ticketmaster to break up, assuming courts will uh, render the Biden administration successful. But the Biden administration is more liberal, and uh, they're suing Ticketmaster to break up Ticketmaster um, so that they can't monopolize concert prices and force us to give up our firstborn, basically, to see Green Day live, you know? Uh, so generally, at the very beginning of today's conversation, we talked about equality versus freedom. And liberalism is not anti-freedom. It's not. But it does lean more towards equality than it does towards freedom. So if I was to create like this, this scale, and on one side of the scale is equality, and on the other side is freedom. Usually in our society, we kind of put equality on the left and freedom on the right. Generally speaking, liberalism is going to be like here. Is this even the right place to put this? <laughs> I don't know. So this is liberalism. Liberalism is right here. Okay, it's not really a good, good visual for you to have. But you'll notice it's leaning more towards equality than it is towards freedom. It's not anti-freedom. I hate it when people say that about liberalism because I just don't think it's that simple. I don't think freedom is a light switch. It's not anti-freedom. But, you know, we have to make political choices. And liberals will often choose to kind of slide towards the equality end of the scale than they will the freedom end of the scale. Now, we'll talk about political parties later this semester, but America is run by two political parties, and one of them is the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is a liberal political party. 
That's what the, the current Biden administration is Democratic. And we'll talk about political parties later, but we have one primary, one very powerful liberal party in America, and it's known as the Democratic Party. Okay. Democratic. We'll talk about that later. Good for you to know those names, though. And for the record, Democratic, you know, we'll talk about the Republican Party here in a minute. Democrat, Republican, those don't mean anything. Those are just team names. Okay, they might as well call themselves the Chiefs and the Bills. But the Democratic Party, that's just their team name for we are the liberal political party. Now, liberalism is a sensible ideology. I hope you looked at that previous screen and you said to yourself, well, I don't know if I'm liberal or not. Maybe you are. But it's uh, sensible. It's rational. It's reasonable. That's why a third of Americans subscribe to it. But liberalism also carries with itself necessary weaknesses. Obviously, if you're going to have the government doing more things for more people, it's going to cost more money. That's not a lot of fun. That's not a lot of fun. But it is. It's going to cost more money. Taxes may very well go up. In addition to that, um, you could argue that social safety net, which is supposed to catch people so that they can be caught and then crawl out of it. Some people really never try to crawl out of it. Some people treat it like a hammock. Uh, we might know a few examples of that in our personal life. Now, I'm not a big fan of believing that people are exploiting the welfare system to live high on the hog. I don't think that's happening. But I do think it's indisputable that some people just have no desire to leave uh, the social safety net. A third argument is really the argument that liberalism maybe has too much faith in the government's ability to solve problems. Uh, I mean, is that really all always going to be the answer to whatever problems crop up? Uh, more government, more government regulation here, more government regulation there. Is that always the way to go? I mean, maybe, but maybe not. Let's compare this to conservatism. Ugh, already I can tell this is the wrong place to put this. Let me move this for you while you write this definition. While you write that definition down. Notice how liberalism more towards the equality side. Anyways, conservatism advocates for a limited role for the national government. Okay, now it has other things like supporting traditional values, traditional lifestyles, cautious response to change. But the primary thing driving conservatism is advocating for the government to have a limited role in our lives. Now, um, folks, how much do you know about conservatism? Do you consider yourself more conservative? Uh, do you have conservative family members? Uh, do you not like conservatives at all? That's all fine. That's all fine. Um, but a third of Americans describe themselves as conservative. A third of Americans do. And, um, you know, uh, that's, that's for any number of reasons. But the primary reason is because conservatism is sensible. It's rational, just like we talked about with liberalism. Conservatism disagrees with liberalism, but they're both rational ways of being. Like liberalism, conservatism is also based on an indisputable truth. Even if you don't like conservatism, it is indisputable that every time you empower the government, you risk giving it too much power. Every time, we just saw this with communism, every time you empower the government, you are risking giving it too much power. Too much power can equate to like governmental abuse, so, with that in mind, if that's what we're tangling with, is potential government abuse, why even tangle with that bear altogether? Tell you what, let's bench the government by and large, and let's let the private market drive society forward. Like, capitalism is not like, you know, like I said, I wouldn't put a halo over capitalism. 
but I don't want to empower the government and risk oppression necessarily. So what we need is actually the private market to drive society forward, these private businesses competing with each other. And of course, at the very least, that ensures a degree of individual freedom for ourselves. Now, it's worth mentioning that when we talk about uh, conservatism, we're not like anti-government here. We're not anti-social safety net. We're not anti-redistribution of wealth. What we're talking about is just less, less across the board less government, a limited government. We want less redistribution of wealth, less social safety net. We want less government regulation. Maybe there is a problem with Ticketmaster. You know what? Maybe the free market can sort it out on its own. So says maybe some conservatives. So you can see how that cautiousness when it comes to the government would actually give conservatism a preference for freedom instead of equality. And that doesn't mean, again, this really upsets me when people talk about conservatism too, um, too bluntly and they say it's anti-equality or it resists anti-equality or they say it's the same thing as bigotry. I don't think that's the case. Um, but we have to make political choices and, cons and conservatives find themselves coming down more often on the freedom end of the scale. Give you just a minute on that. Now, it's worth noting, once again, there is a liberal political party in America. We talked about that just a moment. It's called the Democratic Party. Uh, there is a conservative political party in America, and it's known as the Republican Party. Re that's an R. <laughs> Republican Party. And again, that name doesn't mean anything. The Republican Party doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. When you see Republican Party, that basically means we are America's biggest political party that supports conservatism. That's what that means. Okay. So conservatism, reasonable baby, it's reasonable. There's a reason why a third of Americans consider themselves conservative. There's a reason for that. Um, but like liberalism, it also comes with its own degree of weaknesses. Let's talk about some weaknesses of conservatism, shall we? All right, so weakness number one. Obviously, if we're having the government doing fewer things for fewer people, it's just, you know, if you're one of the less fortunate people in society, if you're one of the less fortunate people in society, um, conservatism just doesn't have as much to offer you as liberalism does. Now, conservatives will say that's the point, right? We don't want to give them as much help to motivate them to give themselves more help. But how much water does that hold with you? Now, another, we just got done dunking on liberals for maybe having too much faith in the government's ability to solve problems. Maybe we can dunk on conservatives for the opposite problem. Maybe they trust the private market too much Maybe they don't trust the government enough. Is that always the correct answer? Less government? Like that's always what we should be doing anytime there's a problem. Get government out, get government out, get government out. You know, maybe, maybe not. And again, as conservatism leans towards freedom, that does mean it is leaning away from equality. And as a result, conservatism historically has had a bad track record on civil rights. And civil rights are all about promoting equality among races, among genders, among gender ideologies, uh, gender identities, I meant to say. And that's not to say that conservatism is the same thing as bigotry. It's not. Um, I'm sure there's a, somebody who is bigoted may end up lining up with conservatism on some thing. It's possible, right? But at the end of the day, um, they are just prioritizing freedom, and that does necessarily mean they will be more resistant to embracing equality. All right, last thing I'll cover for chapter one is that these aren't the only two ideologies out there. It's not just liberalism and conservatism and all other ideas can go fish. There are other ideologies. Uh, by a long, about a third of Americans describe themselves as liberal, about a third of Americans describe themselves as conservative, but a single digit percentage of Americans do describe, describe themselves as 
libertarian. Have you ever heard of libertarians before? So a libertarian is going to be very skeptical and opposed towards almost all government activities. So your libertarians, I don't even know how much this will fit on the screen. Your libertarians are going to be way closer to the freedom end of the scale. They're going to look at what we just said about conservatives. And conservatives were like, there should be less this, less this, less this. And they'll be like, hmm, that's a good start. Less, less, less. Okay. How about we replace less with almost no? There should be almost no government whatsoever. Government should really just be skeletal and have almost no role in our lives. And um, at the, I, it was one or two libertarian presidential conventions ago, there was a huge debate over whether the government should be in charge of handing out driver's licenses. Who's the government to tell me who can drive? So that, that is a radical argument to be having. But again, I don't think that there's any, radical is not the same thing as bad. When we say things are radical, we're not saying they're bad. We're just saying they're very far from the status quo, which <clears throat> even libertarians will admit they are. Libertarians have their own political party. You don't need to know that. You don't need to know that. You need to know what libertarianism is, really. Um, they have their own presidential candidates. And there are some Republicans out there, since the Republican Party is the conservative party, uh, there are some Republicans out there who do describe themselves as libertarians, such as this guy, Rand Paul. You don't need to know these people. All right, now, in addition to that, there is uh, ide another ideology, which, again, more radical than the two mainstream ones, called socialism. Have you heard of socialism? I don't know why my font is smaller there. Sorry about that. But socialism is strong support for equality, including, if need be, government takeovers of some major industries. So these are people who believe that we need to really supersize what we're doing in liberalism. If there are areas in our lives that are inherently unequal, uh, we need to take aggressive government action to, more, to level out the playing field as much as possible. There are certain industries in our society, so say socialists, where um, things are so inherently horridly unequal. They talk about healthcare a lot as being unequal. They're so unequal. We shouldn't even have private healthcare insurance companies. We should just have the government take over this entire industry and offer everybody healthcare. Now, if that sounds like, you know, the government running an industry, if that sounds like communism, there is some overlap between communism and socialism. Socialism is really the first time on this list that we've seen an ideology have a leg in capitalism and a leg in communism. So there is a little overlap, like a Venn diagram of sorts, between the two, kind of like this. Okay. Whereas these three ideologies are all comfortably under the umbrella of capitalism, socialism is kind of the first time that's it's like half under the umbrella. And maybe, I don't know what the, I don't know if you'd say half and half capitalism versus communism, but it's got some part of it under the uh, communist umbrella instead. All right. So like I said, that's a long conversation on chapter one. I hope you took really good notes. It'll be helpful later on. You can trust me. Trust me on that. Um, my future lectures will not be this long because this is actually two lectures packed into one. Um, but, uh, oh, I forgot to mention the socialist uh, socialism has their own socialist political parties. They run their own socialist candidates. And there are Democrats who, Democrats are mostly the liberal political party, but some Democrats describe themselves actually as more socialist. Of course, there's Bernie Sanders. You don't need to know these people, but so be it. Anyways, like I said, this is a longer lecture, and it's a longer lecture because uh, we're really having two lectures in one. Going forward, these lectures are going to be more time compact. In the meantime, if you have any questions, let me know. And hey, nice to know you people. Nice to get to know you now that uh, you've gotten a feel for what lectures will be like this semester. Thank you.